So this is really a discussion of how strategies and policies can enhance the well-being of and build on the strengths of families to prevent abuse and neglect from happening in the first place. What does that look like? And to kick this session off, to to kind of have this conversation, we have some incredible panelists. So I'm going to introduce them briefly, and then uh, Jennifer Jones is going to kick us off as our first presenter. So let me introduce you quickly to Kelly Crane, who is the Policy and Government Relations Manager at Prevent Child Abuse America. Her work is centered on providing leadership, strategic planning, guidance, and support to advance the goals and mission of Prevent Child Abuse America and Healthy Families America. Mia Crockett is the Chief Executive Officer of Families Forward Virginia, Prevent Child Abuse Virginia. Mia is an innovator with a keen desire to co-design a truly family-centered model of well-being. We also have Jennifer Jones, who has been the Chief Strategy Officer at Prevent Child Abuse America since 2021. She also consults and advises organizations on brain science and has been, um, sorry, child welfare and child and family well-being issues and works closely with national organizations and congressional representatives to advance brain science-infused policy and trauma-informed care legislation. We also have Claire Luge, who is the Executive Director, Prevent Child Abuse Arizona. She is also part of Together for Arizona, a collaborative advancing child safety and well-being and serves on Arizona's Thriving Families Safer Children Initiative, which focuses on addressing racial disparities for African Americans in the child welfare system. We also have Jenny Perlman, who brings more than 30 years of nonprofit and legal experience to her roles as the Chief Policy Officer of Safe and Sound, a leading child advocacy organization based in San Francisco. I mean, can we get a round of applause for this? I know, right? For this panelist uh, collection, I'm very excited. So with that, we're going to kick off with Jennifer Jones. We want to say good morning and thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's so great to be here. Um, no no pressure now to uh, to see all the emojis coming, uh, coming up and coming through. Um, I'm going to share just, so, okay, great, great. Um, let me just take a minute here to share my screen. All right. Um, so I uh, just want to start by saying thank you to Jess and the team at uh, at Caltrin um, for inviting us to, um, to, to be here with you all today. Um, we are all very excited to spend the next 90 minutes with you. Um, and I love uh, all of the excitement in the chat box. Um, I actually reside in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and we found out right before we started that Jess also likes Madison or likes Wisconsin. So um, uh, great to be here with you uh, from uh, the Midwest. Um, so as Jess mentioned, my name is Jennifer Jones and I am the Chief Strategy Officer at Prevent Child Abuse America. And I'm actually gonna start us off today uh, by sharing just a little bit more about Prevent Child Abuse America and some of the work that we're doing uh, around creating a primary prevention ecosystem uh, in our country. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, and share some brief facts about child abuse and neglect. Uh, and then I'm gonna turn it to my colleague, Kelly Crane, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit more about um, uh, neglect itself and poverty and some policy strategies that we can all uh, consider and think about as we're working to address child abuse and neglect in our country. Um, as Jess mentioned, we have an amazing group of uh, other panelists uh, with us today from our from our state chapter network, um, along with uh, with one of our key partners, Jenny uh, from Safe and Sound. Um, so we're gonna they're gonna talk about the work that they're doing uh, in their states and in their communities to address child neglect. Um, so they get some specific examples. Uh, of some great work that's happening across the country. So um, uh, as uh, as Jess mentioned, we have Claire from Prevent Child Abuse Arizona. We have Mia from Families Forward Virginia, um, both state uh, chapters of Prevent Child Abuse America. Uh, and then we have Jenny from Safe and Sound. And we'll have some time at the end uh, for some questions and discussion. Um, so quickly, just want to share a little bit about who we are. Um, Prevent Child Abuse America is the nation's oldest and largest organization uh, in the U.S. that's committed to preventing child abuse and neglect before it happens. 
Um, we promote policies and programs and resources that are all informed by the science. Um, and we work to create the conditions for all kids and families and communities to thrive. And we have a number of ways uh, that we do that um, and that we work to achieve our vision. So we have a nationwide uh, network of prevent child abuse state chapters. We're in 45 states across the country. Uh, we have Arizona and Virginia with us here today. Um, we also have a signature home visiting program, Healthy Families America. Um, we're located in about 600 sites across the US um, and we're, we're one of only two home visiting programs that has been shown to actually prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, and so we partner closely with our state chapter networks uh, and our home visiting sites to advance our collective mission uh, and vision. Um, we also have a robust research arm that really helps us to understand the latest science and the research so that we can better inform our programs uh, and our policies. But we also contribute to the science as well. Um, we conduct our own research. And in fact, we currently have a grant from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, that is looking at the impact of paid family leave and child care subsidies on child abuse um, and intimate partner violence. Um, we also have a awesome national policy team. Kelly Crane is here from that. Um, and we advocate at the federal level uh, for key federal programs that really help support children and families like community-based child abuse prevention, the child tax credit, paid family leave, um, and, uh, and other things. Uh, McV, um, the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. And then we also assist states, um, our state chapters in particular, um, on state level policy efforts. And then finally, to transform the narrative around prevention uh, in our country, our communications team really works closely with our state chapter network, our HFA sites to really articulate, elevate, and amplify our message and mission. Um, so I wanna share a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing over the past two years. We've been engaged in a adaptive strategy process, and this process was intentional and grounded in research and evidence. We worked or engaged, I should say, uh, nearly 1,700 individuals across the country, including parents and caregivers, um, our national office staff, our Healthy Families America staff, key partners uh, across the country. As part of the adaptive strategy process, we created a theory of change, which is really helping to guide uh, our efforts um, in terms of the prevention of child abuse and neglect um, and addressing the social determinants of health. So you see here our theory of change, and you'll see a little bit more as well, um, draws on the most cutting edge thinking and research in our field, um, both in terms of prevention as well as in terms of systems change. It lays out the aspirations that we all want to achieve for children and families in our country, what we believe we need to do in order to build a comprehensive and primary prevention ecosystem, the strategies we need to employ to achieve our aspirations, and then all of this work is grounded in our values and beliefs. Um, so last August at our national conference, our sold out national conference in Baltimore, our president and CEO, Dr. Melissa Merrick, uh, formally announced our new theory of change for primary prevention in the US. Um, in, our, in this visual here, you can see our North Star is at the top. Our aspirational outcomes are in the middle circle. Our comprehensive primary prevention ecosystem is along the bottom. Our identified strategies are on the right, uh, the top right corner, and our values and beliefs are the top left corner. Um, as the theory of change was being developed, um, it became clear pretty quickly that this framework has the potential to guide the broader field of primary prevention uh, in the US. So the first element of a theory of change is the North Star. Um, and the North Star really represents the vision and the future that we hope to achieve. So our PCA America North Star is that all children and families are living a purposeful and happy life with hope for the future. So we believe by addressing the root causes of child abuse and neglect, including the social determinants of health, poverty and systemic racism, that not only can we prevent child abuse and neglect and reduce the number of kids and families 
that are coming to the attention of our nation's child welfare system, we can actually ensure that all children and families are living a purposeful uh, and a purposeful and happy life with hope for the future. But we believe that in order to address these systemic conditions that we need to build a comprehensive and aligned primary prevention ecosystem in our country, one that currently does not exist and that includes a diverse array of actors, all of you on this call, um, working in a collective way uh, and with a shared sense of urgency. So the research has found that this primary prevention ecosystem is more likely to advance positive childhoods for all children when these seven levers along the bottom uh, of the slide here are present. Um, and this includes things like shifting mindsets, having policies and practices in place that support all children um, support positive and equitable childhoods for all children. And then family supports and opportunities and environments, things like home visiting and family resource centers. You'll hear, you're, you'll hear from Jenny a little bit later about the work they're doing at Safe and Sound. Um, so all of these things that are accessible and meeting the needs of all families. Um, if we build this ecosystem, we can achieve our four aspirational outcomes that you see on the top of the slide. And that includes loving and secure family relationships, access to formal and informal family supports, where you live and when you need them, um, mental, mental and physical health uh, and well being across the lifespan, and financial stability and economic mobility. So, what do we mean by primary prevention? Um, you can see here we have described primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Prevent Child Abuse America is solely focused or largely focused on primary prevention, which is really about creating the conditions for all children, families, and communities to thrive. And that means we have to address child abuse and neglect before it actually happens. And so our theory of change for primary prevention in the US includes these five strategies. And these are the strategies that we have identified along with all of the folks that we talked about. I mentioned earlier, we talked to 1700 folks across the country. Um, these are essential in order to build this comprehensive and aligned primary prevention ecosystem and ultimately achieve our aspira aspirational outcomes for children and families. So you can see them here. I won't necessarily read them because I know I'm running close on time here. I want to keep keep going. But things like transforming the narrative around prevention, centering families as partners uh, in decision making, um, and advocacy and research. Um, I mentioned earlier that throughout the process, it became really clear that the value of this theory of change is not just for PCA America and not just for our strategic efforts, but that, but that it creates a primary prevention framework for the entire country. And so we have created this idea of a plug and play theory of change, where really anyone, including all of you on the phone, can insert your strategies and your values and all of your efforts will align with our shared work to build this comprehensive primary prevention ecosystem and achieve the shared outcomes, again, that we all long desire for kids and families across this country. So as I get to kind of closing, I want to I want to uh, uh, provide some context, um, and some of this is going to be very familiar to all of you. But I think it's essential. We think it's essential as we get into talking more specifically about neglect um, and what the fo what folks uh, in the states and communities are doing. So the latest report on child maltreatment um, during federal fiscal year twenty uh, twenty two an estimated 3 million children received uh, either an investigation response or an alternative response for child abuse and neglect. And this is across the US. Um, of those children, over 558,000 were considered victim, victims of child abuse and neglect. And that breaks down to 74% for neglect, um, seven or 17% for physical abuse and 11% for sexual abuse. Um, and what we know is that nearly 73% of children in poverty are children of color, which represents a significant inequity 
compared to uh, white children. So for example, while 14% of US children are black, they make up 27% of children living below the poverty line. Um, also black children in the South have the lowest access to amenities that we know are associated with healthy childhood development compared to black children uh, in other regions. And these includes things like safe neighborhoods, parks, access to parks and green space, playgrounds, uh, libraries, et cetera. And we know that families lacking income and resources for basic needs are often referred to the child protective services system for neglect. Um, and this disproportionately impacts black and indigenous families. Overall, 37% of children and young people in the US experience an investigation for child maltreatment before they turn 18. So almost 40% of all children are subjected to a child welfare investigation in our country. For white kids, it's about 28%. Um, and for black kids, it's significantly higher, um, over 53% um, of black kids. Um, this is where the disparities in the child welfare system for Black and other families of color start. Um, and we know from extensive research around trauma um, and adversity that just an investigation like this can actually cause significant harm and trauma to families and children. And we know this matters. It matters because we know that if there was a comprehensive primary prevention ecosystem in this country that was addressing poverty and systemic racism, these slides, the, this data, these data would look very different. Um, so again, as you saw in my earlier slide, most kids are being removed for neglect. And these are things like failure to meet basic needs such as adequate food, and clothing and housing or other basic care like medical care. It's the inability to care for their kids uh, due to substance use or mental health. Um, but all this is significant because it highlights the opportunity for us to support families sooner with economic and concrete supports. Um, and that can prevent system, uh, system entry by addressing poverty. Um, so there are several key factors related to the large number of children and families, and especially children and families of color that are involved in the child welfare system. And we know that poverty is one of the most significant. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 14% of US children are black, yet they make up 27% of children living below the poverty line. So what do we know? We know that too many families are being subjected to harmful investigations, too many families are being separated due to a range of things that we could address sooner, like poverty. Um, there is great disproportionality, especially for Black children and families. And overall, there is very little, uh, too little, we would say, investment in prevention. Currently, there is about $33 billion in public expenditures, uh, billion, I said, uh, in state by state and local child welfare agencies, about 15% of that is actually spent on prevention. So while we know that child welfare system reform work remains critical and all of us uh, uh, remain committed and involved in that in order to ensure better outcomes for families and young people who are currently in the system and who are entering every day. But we also know that there are a broad set of factors um, that are impacting families, many of which are tied to poverty, that must be addressed sooner. So there is extensive research on the impact that economic and concrete supports has on child maltreatment. Our good friends and colleagues at Chapin Hall, uh, Claire Anderson in particular, has been leading a lot of that work. Um, this is one of the many studies that showed that for every $1,000 that state spent per person in poverty, that child abuse and neglect reports, substantiations, foster care placement, and child fatalities related to abuse and neglect all decreased. This all highlights the importance of economic and concrete supports in preventing child abuse and neglect. And so now I have the pleasure of turning it over to Kelly Crane uh, to talk more about neglect, poverty, uh, and policy. 
So thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, discussion and conversation uh, in a little bit. Kelly? Thanks, Jen. Um, that was great context setting and I appreciate it all. Um, there's a lot of fun reactions. So um, exciting that that was shared. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, okay, I think that worked. Let me know if it didn't. Um, but um, as Jen said, thank you. Jen really sent laid, I'm sorry, I'm Kelly Crane, as Jen said, I'm with Prevent Child Abuse America and I'm the Policy and Government Relations Manager. So get to talk to you today, um, lifting up all the groundwork that Jen laid on around what, um, what our North Star is and what we hope for all children and, and families. And then I get to talk about kind of the policy that can support what we want for children and how to help build that primary prevention ecosystem that doesn't yet exist. So first I wanna just uh, dig into what Jennifer just started to talk about um, and really talk about neglect and how that looks at the federal level and how it's defined at the state level. Um, and then talk a little bit about how that neglect is sometimes conflated with poverty um, and how the prioritization of funds are um, spent around addressing child maltreatment and then talk about the, the policy options to support all of that. So just um, to take a big step back, there is a definition in federal legislation um, that guides states, um, it provides guidance to states by identifying a minimum set of acts or behaviors that define child abuse and neglect, but states really have the authority to um, make their own de um, definitions of child abuse and neglect in their own jurisdictions. So the Federal Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, or CAPTA, which was last amended in 2010, defines child abuse and neglect at a minimum as um, these kind of elements. So any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or a caretaker, which results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation, or an act or failure to act, which, which presents an imminent risk of serious harm. So this definition of child abuse and neglect refers to parents and other caregivers. And then a child in this definition um, means a person who is younger than age 18 or who isn't um, an emancipated minor. So as I said, the, the minimum standards that are set up by CAPTA for the definition, each state is responsible for providing their own definitions of child abuse and neglect. And as you can imagine, those definitions of child abuse and neglect can vary widely across states. Um, it can also be defined in criminal statute or civil statute. Um, and states really recognize the different types of abuse throughout their definitions. So including physical abuse, neglect, sexual abuse um, and emotional abuse. Some states also include definitions in their statute for parental substance use and or for abandonment as child abuse. Um, so these state laws really provide much greater detail of how abuse and neglect are defined across states and how they get implemented. So just a real quick picture of all the state laws. There's nearly every state, DC and all of the territories provide definitions in statute um, for abuse and neglect. Um, the majority of states do have a definition of neglect in their statute, and approximately nine states don't have kind of a standalone definition of neglect. However, in those cases, their definitions of abuse do include aspects of neglect. So as Jen shared, child neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment at 74% of all cases. Um, and while the majority of states have a definition of neglect, there's no uniform definition of neglect. So states determine their own definitions, which then get enacted in statute. Um, but frequently, neglect is defined as the failure of a parent or other person with responsibility for the child to provide needed food, clothing, shelter, access to medical care, or education. So as you can imagine, it looks very different across states because states are very different. So this is just a snapshot. It is pulled from a state analysis of state definitions of neglect in 2021. Um, and as you can see how states define neglect and what they include in those definitions vary widely across states. Um, so at a really high level, almost all states deviate in some way from the federal CAPTA definition. So they provide their own kind of definition. There are inconsistent definitions across states and across even the same categories of neglect. Um, and some elements are not defined at all in certain states. So when we think about this variation across definitions of neglect and how decision makers have the responsibility to kind of implement this in their own states, 
Um, there's a lot of considerations that those decision makers and maybe advocates um, across states are exploring. Um, when they think about how neglect is defined in their own state or how it can oftentimes be conflated with poverty as Jen was talking about. So this is just kind of a snapshot of some of the considerations when thinking about how neglect is defined in the state. There's really been little consensus across those definitions regarding whether to define neglect based on parental action or inaction um, or a child's experience. So child neglect isn't always the result of a parent failing to attend to their children's needs. Sometimes the options aren't available due to lack of, lack of funds or understanding, or lack of resources. And then neglect has generally been defined dichotomously, so meaning neglect or no neglect. But we know that's not true. It's often arbitrary or unclear as to where to draw the line or give the label um, around circumstances of neglect. So there's really a continuum of needs of children and not just one item, such as clothing, that could be neglect. Um, and then the idea of actual versus perceived or potential harm. There's no federal definition of what harmful acts or failure to act by a caregiver means. And that's broadly, broadly defined by states. Um, and that impacts people of color and women, low-income families negatively. And some statutes don't take into kind of the intention, parental intention, the willingness or capacity, um, or even account for cultural or religious beliefs, access to resources. Some states include exceptions in their neglect definition, which is important to consider. For example, kind of that poverty or uh, Lack of financial resources doesn't constitute neglect. So sometimes that is included in definitions. Um, considerations for how to untangle poverty and neglect, as these two can oftentimes be conflated, especially when considering housing or food insecurity. And then lastly, just considerations around how, how a policy gets implemented, how that gets moved into practice is important for um, decision makers. We're taking another step up. We all know, and Jen kind of laid this groundwork too, that we know that all families experience stress, even well-resourced or well-resourced or supported families experience stress. And when those multiple stressors or risk factors build up in families, um, children have a greater likelihood of experiencing maltreatment. And other conditions or attributes in families, such as protective factors, will light, lessen the likelihood of child maltreatment. Um, so these protective factors or positive childhood experiences balance out the negative experiences. So on the scale there, kind of when we have more positive experiences, you can balance out the negative experiences. And children who have positive experiences early in life are more likely to become healthier, happier adults. Um, and those positive childhood experiences also may reduce the long-term impact um, of trauma. So we know that there are strategies, that those there are lots of positive outcomes, and there are also strategies to help prevent ACEs and help prevent the poor health and life outcomes. So at Prevent Child Abuse America, we often talk um, at a public health approach, and we know that child abuse and neglect prevention is traditionally thought of or viewed as the responsibility of maybe child protective services, although that response is critical, and it's important, it's insufficient, as Jen was kind of saying, to prevent the problem. The extreme burden and consequences of child maltreatment um, makes it a public health issue and a problem that requires an approach that stops abuse and neglect from happening in the first place. So some of the primary prevention activities that we talk about are designed for the general population to provide support to prevent those adverse childhood experiences and minimize the risks before they occur. It includes addressing the context and the conditions in which children and families live, work, and play. Um, it's also an approach that, as Jen referenced at the very beginning, that relies on evidence and data and gets to the root causes of adverse childhood experiences and to the conditions that build the supports needed for all families to thrive. So by addressing those root causes of child abuse and neglect, it allows us to be more hopeful and more solution-oriented and to be more accurate. It can address some of those widely held assumptions to activate more productive ways of thinking about child abuse and neglect. Um, and think of kind of some of the broader um, population level policies that can support families. So in thinking about that public health approach, um, a child, we know that a child's health really does affect us all, that strong stress and trauma can interrupt child development, which puts children at risk for um, physical and mental health issues later on. However, um, as that scale was shown, children with positive experiences are more likely to become healthy, happier adults, which leads to a more productive society for all of us. 
And we know that most parents want to be good parents, but the overload of stress and generational trauma and systematic inequities can take their toll on families. And we also know that parents can parent better when they aren't overloaded with stressors and societal burdens that life can bring. So this is just really kind of a, a whole lot of options, but we know that one way to support families is through policies that support and strengthen families. I'll, Jen mentioned concrete and economic supports is one way that really the evidence has pointed to as a way to support families and prevent child abuse and neglect. So in general, these kind of array of primary prevention initiatives aim to strengthen families and build those protective factors that can decrease the likelihood of child maltreatment by promoting positive parenting practices, um, increasing knowledge about child development, and then buffering against kind of risk factors that contribute to child abuse and neglect. So these strategies can include a lot of policy options. Um, there isn't just one policy option, I wish there was a silver bullet, but there are a range of policy options that together really support families. It can take various forms, um, like supportive services, such as home visiting programs, access to local, local family resource centers, um, strategies, policy options can include kind of raising awareness or awareness campaigns such as safe sleep or shaken baby syndrome, all the way to those policies that do address the economic stability and kind of economic mobility for families. So we know that childhood adversity like neglect is preventable. We know that it's solvable and it's a public issue um, and generally set the stage for that. We know that, so we need the solutions to kind of stop um, child abuse and neglect before it happens. Uh, when families have what they need, when they need it in the communities that they live, work, and play in, um, children can thrive. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how you can all play a role. Um, so I talk a lot about advocacy work with our state chapters um, at the state level and the federal level around how to kind of really use advocacy and lifting our collective voice together to, to prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, so changing and addressing those adverse community conditions we know can reduce adverse childhood experiences, and you all can play a role in that prevention. We may not have the knowledge about what to do, um, or we don't often know how to influence others, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So there are a lot of opportunities to ensure that families have what they need before they're in crisis. That includes policy opportunities and advocacy. So using our own stories, our own knowledge, our own voices to support families is really um, a critical role in all of this. So advocacy is a, it's a powerful tool. It comes in many forms where we can educate and raise awareness with decision makers um, to prevent child abuse and neglect. So here are just some of those kind of ways, but first at its, um, it's important to understand kind of what advocacy is um, and what its role is in raising awareness. At its core, it is really influencing change. Um, that change can be at the state or the federal or the local level or a community level. Um, it's engaging others to support a cause. Advocacy is using your own voice um, to make your own voice heard about important issues that affect our daily lives. And I'm positive that you all um, have been an advocate in some way or some point, whether it's been to advocate for your own child or family member, an advocate for our own health, speaking up about your education or maybe asking for a raise. Um, we've all been an advocate in some way, shape or form. So when thinking about policy changes or community changes, advocate, advocacy is really educating and informing those decision makers. Um, it can be helping to shape an actual state law or shape a budget. It's helping policymakers find solutions to problems in their own community by providing critical information, stories, or sharing resources. It is so powerful that um, it can empower you, it can empower constituents and communities to raise an issue when something needs to change or when something needs to be kind of um, remain constant. It ensures that government resources can be best utilized. Um, it can also protect current resources or funding. It can ensure that a law that gets implemented gets addresses the needs of those that are most impacted. And it positions you as a decision maker. So it's also important to know, I should say this first, it's also important to know who you're influencing, who your elected officials are at your local state and your federal level. So these decision makers really do work for you as an elected official and hearing from their constituents in whatever form about the concerns in their own community really does matter and it really can create change. 
There are many forms of advocacy and reason awareness that are incredibly effective. These are just some activities um, that I'm sure in some shape or form you've likely participated in and didn't even realize. Some are obviously easier lists than others um, and easier to become engaged in, such as um, participating in Child Abuse Prevention Month activities, which is in April. There's usually a lot of activities that happen in April around um, throughout that month that are organized activities to raise an awareness, like Wear Blue Day. Um, that's an event that happens during April, and it's it's a simple and incredibly effective way at raising awareness and starting conversations um, to other activities like writing an op-ed, um, writing a letter to your legislator, sitting in at a like kind of an advocacy day at your state capitol. Um, other examples are just being a resource to letting your legislator or your you know your community members know who you are and let them know that you're a resource to them. So you all can influence public policy and play a role in prevention. And while this may seem big, we've been talking about some big things. Um, Reaching out and sharing your stories and voices are impactful. The science tells us that my child does better when all, I'm sorry, yeah, that my child does better when all children are doing better. So in thinking about your own community or your own relationships and experiences, your voice is important and your stories, our collective stories, our collective kind of um, resources together are important and valuable. So, um, so Jennifer and I really set the stage and provided the context for the next part of the discussion where you were going to get to hear some concrete examples, as Jennifer said, from our state chapters and our state partners um, to really hear about all of this into action and how we can support families in states and in communities. So I have the pleasure of turning it over to Claire Luge from Prevent Child Abuse America, I'll stop, or Prevent Child Abuse Arizona, sorry, Claire, um, to just really hear about what is happening in Arizona around these issues. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thanks so much, Caltrin. Uh, the, the people at Caltrin are so easy to work with and just so lovely. So thank you for inviting us all. So hey, everyone, I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. All right. So my name is Claire Luge. I am the executive director of Prevent Child Abuse Arizona. We are a statewide nonprofit that is dedicated to strengthening families and protecting children. And the way that I like to say it is actually we're dedicated to protecting children by strengthening families, because we know that when families are strong and supported, children do better. All of our children do better. So this month actually marks my 10 years with Prevent Child Abuse Arizona. Time flies. And what I've noticed is that there has been a really positive evolution in our collective understanding of child abuse and neglect, but there is still a long way to go. So about 10 years ago, when I gave presentations to audiences, I would ask them a question, and it was this, how do you prevent child abuse and neglect? And a lot of the times, the answers that I would get were something like this. Well, you look for the signs of child abuse and neglect, and then you call the CPS system to report it. Because the understanding back then, just 10 years ago, was that the way that you prevent abuse and neglect is you call and re you report it. And even though it's important to report abuse and neglect if it is happening, that's not prevention, right? That's really intervention. And we really don't want to just manage the problem of child abuse and neglect. We want to get ahead of it. We want to prevent it before it happens. So a few years later, I would ask audiences the same question. Hey, how do you prevent abuse and neglect? And I started to get a different answer. And that was something like this. Well, you educate. Okay, well, you educate who? Oh, you educate parents, because if parents knew better, they would do better, right? And even though that's a better answer, uh, parenting education and making sure that parents are supported with tips and tools to raise their children, that is a good strategy, but that is one of the many strategies that we need to implement in order to support families. You know, yes, when parents know better, they can do better, but if a family is getting evicted, they don't need a parenting class, they need a home. Right. So now there is this more evolved understanding. When I ask audiences, I typically get more evolved answers and they focus more on what Jennifer said at the beginning, which is that it's about the conditions. It's about the conditions that families are in. So when we shift conditions, uh, when we shift the, the overload and the overwhelm that families are facing, child abuse and neglect simply become less likely. And that is what we need to do. So in my 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about what Arizona is doing, particularly around perception 
and mindset shift. Because the way that we perceive parents and the way that we perceive CPS systems or child protection systems and the way that we perceive abuse and neglect really matters in terms of our decision-making as a society. And when we shift the understanding, when we have a different lens, a strength-based lens on families and this lens of, of support rather than surveillance, that's when we can truly prevent child abuse and neglect from happening and become the community that families need. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about today is this project called Lean On Me AZ. And Lean On Me AZ was an initiative that began in 2020 when everything locked down. And if you remember, you're probably part of conversations like this. A lot of people were worried about children uh, when we went into lockdown because there were less reports to the child abuse hotlines in every state because there were less interactions between children and mandated reporters, especially educators and teachers because children were not in school anymore. And people were wondering, oh my gosh, because of this big change and because of this lockdown, families must be stressed. There must be so much more child abuse and neglect happening. And that was an assumption that we were making. And by the way, it turns out that that did not happen. There was not an increase of child abuse and neglect. So we need to check our assumptions. Uh, but that was the, the wide belief that there was more abuse and neglect happening. And so there are a lot of conversations like that, worried about how are we reporting kids to the hotline if we can't see them? There was a different question that came out in conversations in Arizona, and it was this, wait, why are we focused on reporting children right now? Why are we not first focused on how we can support families during this stressful time? So basically, we know how to report child abuse and neglect. People are pretty good at that, but do we know how to prevent it? And the answer was, Pretty much no, people didn't really know what it looked like to prevent child abuse and neglect. So Prevent Child Abuse Arizona, in collaboration with Casey Family Programs, we launched a program called Lean On Me AZ, or really a project, in which we held 13 focus groups virtually with communities across Arizona. And they were diverse communities across Arizona. And we started off this little discussion focus group with a little presentation on the strengthening families protective factors. And I'm sure that at least some of you are familiar with that framework, but basically when we build the five protective factors, these are the outcomes that happen. Families are stronger, children can develop optimally and child abuse and neglect can be prevented, which are outcomes that we all want. And so these five protective factors are parental resilience, social connections, knowledge of parenting and child development, concrete support in times of need and children's social and emotional competence. And so we gave a little presentation on the protective factors to these community groups. And then we talked about the strategies to build those protective factors. And these are the strategies right here that are outlined by the framework. But then we asked the people in the discussion groups, how do you actually do that? How do you actually respond to families in crisis? What does it look like in communities when everyday people build protective factors? So we really asked those community members, how do you do this? How do people prevent things from happening in your community? How do people support families in your community? And we got incredibly rich and powerful stories. And we took a whole bunch of notes on what they said. They gave examples of how communities were supporting them, but they also gave examples about how community had not supported them in the past. And you know, we wrote that all down and we ended up distilling it into a toolkit. But before I share with you about that toolkit, I wanna to share a few of the stories that came out in those focus groups because they were super powerful. And that was actually my first year being an executive director and it totally changed my lens. It really, by listening to people in communities, it turns out they tend to have the answers and they tend to know what they need as opposed to people who are trying to create strategies without speaking to people with lived experience, families and communities where they are. So it's important to ask people what they think and what to do. So here's a story that came out in almost every discussion group. So it's a version of this. And this one said, once an older couple walked up to me while my four-year-old son was melting down and said, you're doing great. I felt support, so supported I was walking on air. This is such a simple example, right? That someone gives you an encouraging word while you're going through something stressful in public. And as a mom of a two-year-old, I know this feeling well right, of, of this, oh my gosh, are people looking at me? Are people wondering, 
you know, why I can't control my kid or if I'm a bad mom, whatever. There's all these thoughts going on in parents' heads. But if someone in the community says, yep, I've been there, you're doing great. That is a supportive statement that really demonstrates the power of a supportive community. Here's another one that's really powerful. I had a neighbor call the cops on me. My daughter had just come back from foster care and the transition was hard for her. She was having a meltdown. I explained this to the cop. He said, I understand, you're doing a great job. And he left. I went to my neighbor and explained the situation to her too. She apologized. I asked her to please ask me if I needed help before calling the authorities again. Whew. This was powerful for a number of reasons. First of all, the courage of the mom that, that had a call on her, right? The behavior of the cop was really impressive to me, the, the supportive behavior. And what this shows me is that when you know your neighbors and actually interact with them, there's less, uh, there's less need to involve the authorities. Powerful story. One last one that I'll share before moving on is this one. I met a family who yelled whenever they talked to each other. At first glance, I was concerned, but through further observation, I recognized that there was love and safety in this family. They were loud, but the yelling was not abusive. It was cultural. Through a parenting class, the grandmother learned tools to use a gentler approach if she wished. A lot of power in this story too. And what this tells me is check your assumptions. Oftentimes we're comparing families to our own personal standards, as opposed to thinking about their culture and their practices. So Lean On Me AZ was a powerful initiative. And from this, we created a toolkit that ended up creating 26 tips and tools from these discussion groups on how community members can be supportive of families and really prevent child abuse and neglect before it happens. And you can uh, learn more uh, about Lean On Me AZ on this site right here. So moving on, after Lean On Me AZ, what this really informed is, is another project. Uh, and we ended up creating a training called Considering Yourself a Mandated Supporter. You may have heard the phrase mandated supporter before. It's being used across the nation, really to help inform people who work with children and families, who are often mandated reporters, that they're not just reporters, that that's not the beginning and end of how you protect children, right? That's really the last resort but you can really consider yourself a mandated supporter as well. So we designed this training by asking first parents to share their experiences of being reported to, in our state, it's called DCS, the Child Protection System. And then from there, we shared that feedback with groups of educators. And we asked those educators about their experience making reports and their perceptions of the child protection system. And what we found out through those focus groups is that a lot of people misperceive the role of child protection. They really think two false things. One, the child protection system does something about everything that it receives. Whereas in Arizona, half of the reports that go into our system already get screened out, meaning that they don't meet the definition of abuse or neglect. And in our state, nothing gets done with those reports. But then the other half, many of them are investigated, but no abuse or neglect is found. And the other uh, misperception was that DCS or the child protection system is the place to call to get families help. It's not designed or equipped to really do that. So from that feedback, we designed a training that helps educators and other mandated reporters understand the role of the child protection system so that they don't misunderstand it, so they don't rely on it to do things that they can't, and then their own personal role in connecting families to support. And interestingly, one of the biggest ahas for me is that people need permission to, to support. They don't know that it's in their role to connect a family to what they might need. They just don't understand that. But in small ways, we can create more supportive communities by considering ourselves mandated supporters. And then the last thing I'll talk about is that body of work really informed Arizona's main focus right now, which is that we need to create a statewide family support system that is based on the resources that we have. We need to create a primary prevention ecosystem. And what Prevent Child Abuse Arizona is now focused on is building the capacity of family resource centers. So hubs of support where families can get parenting education support, they can meet other families, that they can build their sense of community, and they can get connected to what's available in their own communities. Family resource centers are wonderful for a number of reasons. I'm, I'm gonna end here. They're really the one place to start so they can open the door to 
a bunch of other things are available in the community. They're a great one place to refer a family to get the array of needs uh, met. They're also understanding for, they're responsible for understanding the landscape of what's available. They simplify resource navigation. So whereas there may be tons of resources available in let's say a 211 system, they really simplify that by creating a hub and spoke approach. And what's wonderful about them is they're community-based and they're designed to be responsive to the cultures of the families that are present and living in their community. So with that, I probably went over a little bit, uh, but I would like to pass it on to my colleague, uh, Mia Crockett, who is with Family. Claire, we're going to go, Claire, sorry, we're going to go with Jenny. Uh, Mia's, okay. Uh, just, sorry, okay, great. Sounds good. Wonderful. I'm now going to introduce Jenny, uh, Jenny Perlman, of course, of Safe and Sound in California. Hi, everyone. Thank you for bearing with us as we get some slides up. Uh, we're doing a quick change here. One of our colleagues, Mia, is uh, at another meeting, but she will be here afterwards. Thank you so much um, for having me here today. I am Jenny Perlman. I am with an organization called Safe and Sound. Um, I am the chief policy officer there. Safe and Sound is a family resource center um, and the Child Abuse Prevention Council in San Francisco. Um, and I have the opportunity to work on both systems level advocacy and policy, as well as practice reform and coalition work, um, including heading up a coalition of 40 plus family support organizations, um, which includes family resource centers in San Francisco. Uh, I, in the Q&A, would be happy to answer any questions about that coalition and how we have worked together to really build a system of support in San Francisco, um, a system of child and family well-being. But today I'm really gonna focus um, and kind of give some more context about state policy and practice work in California um, related to reform of the mandated reporting system. Because of you, as you have heard, um, it is really essential to addressing poverty, um, which is often conflated with neglect. And so one aspect in addition to building up that system of support and that early intervention for families, uh, which Claire just talked about, it's really important to change the policy and systems around it. So I'm gonna focus on what we've been doing in California today. I've had the opportunity to be on the mandate reporting to community supporting task force, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And I have sat in the chair of family resource centers for California. Next slide, please. Um, before I get into these, I just also want to give a shout out to colleagues at the LA County Mandated Supporting Initiative and the Mandated Reporting Community Supporting Task Force um, for some of the content in these slides. This slide here, I just, we've heard a lot of statistics and information. And this slide here, I really just want you to think a little bit, um, do a little self reflection about what it is like when you observe poverty in a family. I know many of you work directly with families experiencing poverty. Um, and while you've been listening to all of this and you listen, you see, listen to my slides, I just want you to, to sort of absorb some of this um, and think about are our feelings about poverty and then reporting that potentially as neglect, are they influenced by negative uh, perceptions, by biases, um, there's a lot of research out there that shows that mandate reporters make reporting decisions that are driven by bias and by fear of the system related to mandate reporting, um, fear of liability, fear of getting in trouble, fear of not knowing what to do with the family. The mandate reporting system is not designed, um, as Claire mentioned, to really prevent child abuse and neglect by strengthening those protective factors for families and connecting them to what they really need to stay together. Instead, that system is designed almost to separate families. Instead of leading with how do we keep families safe and together, we often lead with, oh, let's report them to child welfare. Um, and as I'm gonna talk about later, that has a lot of impacts. 
Um, next slide, please. Just setting the stage a little more, Jen set this, um, we're gonna look at the statistics. Why are we having this conversation around reforming mandate reporting? One is because of the significant over-reporting. Um, I know that Jen in the beginning talked about at the federal level um, and the California level, we really mirror that same mandate reporting, or sorry, those same statistics. Um, general neglect is the majority of reports in California this year, it was 45% of reports. Traditionally across the country, it's about 50%. Um, and less than 11%, one in nine of those reports are substantiated, which means that substantiated is when child welfare determines that abuse or neglect likely occurred. That is just one in nine. Um, and we also know that this reporting has a significant disproportionate impact, particularly on black and brown families in California, particularly on black and native children. Um, and one in two will experience a child welfare investigation by the time they're 18. We know that this is a real issue. We know that poverty is often conflated with neglect and that there are many reasons. I know some but some other people talked about what those reasons are, but they often are because of our historic systems that have not allowed for wealth creation for families of color. Um, this These stats show us there's a huge disconnect and that there's something wrong with our system and we need to do something about it. Next slide. What are the consequences of over-reporting? I know that many of us have been taught in mandated reporting trainings, clearly not the trainings in Arizona, um, but taught that, you know, just report. If you don't know, make a report to Child Welfare Hotline. And some of us think that there are no consequences or very little consequences, particularly if the allegations are not substantiated, but that's not true. There are very real consequences. Um, I, we've talked about some of them that uh, this increases risks for families by distrusting their, uh, by breaking their trust in organizations um, that might support them. And families often don't seek resources as a result of the fear of being reported. It overburdens the child protection hotline so that the child protection hotline cannot really focus on those situations where families are really unsafe and truly need to protect them and it creates significant trauma. Even if a case is not substantiated, a family stays in the system um, forever, basically, until their child ages out. Um, next slide. So in California, after looking at all this, there was a movement to do something. And um, there were a lot of different things going on uh, and a lot of things came together. And in 2022, um, what you see here, uh, one of our state bodies called the Prevention and Early Intervention Subcommittee of the State Child Welfare Council um, decide, made seven recommendations. And those seven recommendations, the first is the one that I've been talking about mostly is about shifting the focus from mandate reporting to community supporting and creating a task force to do that. And then recommendations two through seven really about what Claire was referring to in creating that community pathway, because the families, when they're reported, many, many mandated reporters just don't know what to do and they wanna support the family, but they don't know how. So we have to build that system. We have to invest in the prevention. We have to invest in mandated reporters knowing where to go. We have to invest in building what many refer to as a community pathway. So those were recommendations two through seven. I'm gonna focus on recommendation one. What have we been doing in California around reform of mandate reporting? Next slide, please. Um, the first, which happened sort of simultaneously with these recommendations going forward and being approved by the Child Welfare Council was we, uh, I know that we changed our statutory definition of general neglect in California, a group of, a coalition of a variety of different groups, including family resource centers, which I was a part of that coalition, 
we advocated to change the definition of neglect in California with respect to mandated reporting. And the change, so what are they? You see here in blue, the changes are that general neglect now no longer is to include a parent's economic disadvantage. And that really is the essence of the goal to untangle the definition of general neglect, um, to untangle poverty from, from that definition of general neglect. And then we also raise the standard for reporting um, to ensure that it's really, you don't report under net general neglect unless, as you see in blue here, there's a substantial risk of serious physical harm or illness to the child. Next slide. Um, here you'll see, you know, what are the potential consequences or impacts of this new law, which is referred to as AB 2085. Um, and really these things here are the things that are counteracting some of those consequences of overreporting that I talked about before. Next slide, please. So I referred to, in addition to this change in the law, we are also created a task force in California, and I'm going to zip through this now. This task force. Um, you see here the purpose of this task force was to create a coordinated statewide effort to reform mandated reporting. Um, both and look at all aspects, legis legal, legislative, redesign of the training like they've done in Arizona, as well as practice reforms that are necessary to implement change. Next slide. Um, this slide really gives you an overview of how we created this task force. Um, we brought together, had a huge selection process, over 215 applications from across the, straight, the state nearly 25% have lived expertise. It's been very important to us to include lived expertise. Um, and the task force began meeting in September of 2023. Um, and the task force has just come up with recommendations that are actually being presented tomorrow to the, the Child Welfare Council, uh, the State Council, and that council will vote on these recommendations in September. Next slide. And I just have a few more minutes left. So I'm going to give a very uh, high overview of what these recommendations are. I've categorized, and they're still in draft. Um, they'll be voted on in September by the Child Welfare Council. So the first is around implementation. So really wanting to ensure that there is a committee. Um, we created an advisory committee to implement all the recommended changes going forward and to continue to gather more data um, on the impact of reporting. Next slide. Then there's several suggested changes to the mandated reporting law. Um, one about removing general neglect, changing the definition of severe neglect, um, also looking at uh, narrowing the number of categories of mandated reporters, and then encouraging a pilot to look at getting rid of liability or failure to report. Next slide. We're also looking at training and recommending having a, a that uh, some uniformity in training um, across the state, as well as recommending that all mandated reporters are required to be trained uh, since that is not the case in California. And then finally, next slide. And then really to invest in that community pathway and the narrative change. And one way to invest in that community pathway is to do an assessment of actually what exists in each county. What are the resources that exist? And so my last is my ask for you. Um, as my colleagues have talked about, there are opportunities to get involved in advocacy. Um, I think we heard a lot um, about some of those opportunities, but find out what's going on in your state and how you might get involved. Thank you very much. I am going to hand it over to Mia, if she has joined us. Hi, 
Hi, Jenny. Hello, all. Thank you for the warm handoff. And what I will do now is share my screen so that we can get into my presentation that will really be talking about the work of Families Forward Virginia, as well as the work that we're doing with our Family Resource Center Network. So I'm going to share my screen now. And we'll kind of get started like that. And I'm assuming if I can get a thumbs up to say that you can see the screen, that'll be great. Looks great. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's jump right in. I know we're towards the end of the time, our time together. So I appreciate everyone's patience. So let's talk about Families Forward Virginia and who we are. I am uh, Mia Crockett. I am the CEO of Families Forward Virginia. I've been in the role for about three years. And we are really a team of 31 professionals at the state office, meaning that we provide technical assistance and quality assurance to about 55 local programs um, statewide um, in Virginia that look at working with very specific local communities. So what we do in this role is we also are the home for three of the eight home visiting models in the state of Virginia. We are the state office for three of the largest. We also do sexual abuse prevention. We do parenting support groups because as we know, parenting does not come with a handbook. We also have family resource centers, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. We do professional development for home visiting um, for home visitors, as well as our FRC liaisons. And we also do advocacy and public policy and awareness. So let's talk about our mission. This is what drives us every day at Families Forward in Virginia. We really look to advance programs, practices, and policies that nurture children, empower families, and support communities. Really excited about this mission because it really guides our work and it really says this is what we do, and this is how we want to impact families across our state. And of course, our vision is that all children grow up to be safe and loved and free from harm. That's the heartbeat of, of our organization. This is what we strive to be. This is our North Star. So our reach. A lot of times I lovingly think of Families Board as an octopus because we have our tentacles in like so many different places and programs across the state. Um, we've got Healthy Families Virginia, which is a home visiting program. We have Circle of Parents, which is a parent support program. That's a statewide parent support program. Early Impact Virginia really is an alliance of all eight home visiting models that we work with um, at Families for Virginia. CHIP of Virginia is our own home visiting model that's homegrown, not a national model, but just a very specific state model to Virginia. We have Parents as Teachers, which is another national home visiting model that we're the state office of. Our Darkness to Light is our adult child sexual abuse prevention arm, and then our hugs and kisses is our elementary school sexual child abuse prevention arm. So we've kind of talked to the adults as well as talking to parents about good touch, bad touch. We are the state chapter Prevent Child Abuse America. And we also are part of our Thriving Family Safe for Children Network, which is where our home, our FRC network resides. I think I've covered all of our slides. So yeah, we are an octopus and we do a lot of different things. So let's talk about the Thriver Fam Thriving Family Safer Children Network. So really, the Family Resource Center was really a strategy to strengthen family resiliency, um, which you heard from the other presentations about child abuse and neglect and the disproportionality of our persons of color impacting and being trapped and kept in systems. We thought as a state that perhaps if we were to kind of broaden that preventive preventative strategy with FRCs, we might, of course, reduce the likelihood of child abuse and neglect because we'll be meeting families in communities where they live, work, and play with the resources they need, when they need it, and how they need it. Of course, this FRC is also another way to advance racial equity and support for our underserved communities, as well as looking at how we can address the complex issues of families being um, involved in the child welfare system. So we do have seven FRC sites um, in the state of Virginia that are, that are actively serving families as we speak. So one of the things I kind of like to do a background context, like how did we get to family resource centers? Why was that kind of our project at the state from the Thriving Families work? We knew that there was a singular North Star. I think you guys have seen a lot of North Stars um, today. So here's another North Star that with the Commonwealth of Virginia, we really said that we wanted all families, youth and children 
um, that are they want we want them to be safe, healthy, and nurtured, and have equitable equitable accesses to resources, and also really thrive in our communities. I think one of the things that we thought about as a state um, was how do we connect those dots and reduce the 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 need for the child welfare system. So about three or four years ago, the state, um, our state department of social services, along with ourselves, Families Forward Virginia, and some other state partners came together to kind of look at how we could disrupt this whole child welfare system feeder. Like kids were just hitting the system, um, unwanted cases, but then you're in the system, how to get up, how to get the children and families back to connect it. We knew that there was a huge gap and we knew we needed to do something totally different than ever that had ever been done before. So that's kind of how we kind of came upon the Thriving, Thriving Families Safer Children um, project. Um, as you can tell from the slides, it's a first of its kind partnership. And really it was the idea to transform. So not break systems down, but to transform, to create a brand new system that looked at being proactive as opposed to reactive, to look at what does family well-being look like as opposed to inequitable resources and, and families being split apart. So we really wanted to look at that in a more tangible way. And we felt like the FRC, the Family Resource Network, could be a place to start. So one of the things that came out of our state prevention plan, which was a, one of the guiding documents that kind of led to the FRC idea, was that we really wanted to look at well-being and economic stability, person and family-centered programs, social norms, collaboration, and infrastructure. Those were the big kind of anchoring uh, pillars that came out of that state prevention plan. And Families Forward said, you know, we can lean in on, on a couple of these things really hard. We knew that we wanted to look at person and family center programs, because that's kind of what we do as a state office. And then we were looking at how can we like transform social norms and just reduce that stigma stigma about asking for help and reduce the stigma of, hey, every family um, needs help and it's okay to ask for help. And we don't want to give people a hand out, but really want to give them a hand up. How do we empower and change that narrative? So we thought that as a as a families forward agency, as a prevent child abuse America chapter, there might be two places in that state plan that we could really lean in and, and share some knowledge around. So I kind of skipped a bit. So in this place, so after we kind of looked at the state plan, we really decided that the FRC, the Family Resource Center model might be a place to start. Because as you all know, there's many paths to prevention. And when we look at equitable access to resources, how do we do that in a way that makes sense for specific communities? And I don't know if your community is anything like mine in Virginia, but you meet one community in Virginia and you've really just met one. And so we are a commonwealth, means we are a commonwealth, we're a collection of many counties and many um, cities that are kind of coming together. And what we realized as we looked out at from a state office perspective, that there were some communities that were oversaturated with a lot of prevention programs, and there were some areas in the state that had none, or maybe just one. And so we said, you know, what is a way to look at broadening that net and casting a wider net around prevention service that might work, that may not have the same um, rules or regulations as home visiting models, but could be a little bit more of a broader swath to really adjust and work at, and think about protecting families and strengthening communities in a way that makes sense. And that's kind of how our family resource centers um, were birthed. And that's kind of, how, that was the impetus for that. But as we thought about reaching out to communities and connecting to communities where people live, work and play, we also realized as a state that we did not want to descend down on communities and say, hey community, this is what you need to be uh, a successful thriving community. Instead, we said, who are the folks that live in these communities that they're, they are the informal leaders, they are the big mamas on the block, they are the people that know what's going on in the communities. Who are those folks? And that's kind of when we ended up looking at and leaning into this idea of having Lex leadership. And Lex leadership is actually lived experience expert. Those are the folks that know or either have had uh, intimate knowledge with the child welfare system, Maybe they have gotten out of it. Maybe they had a success story from the child welfare system. But we knew that if we did not have folks, boots on the ground, who could really speak to those things, that our FRC endeavors would end up being kind of a top-down approach versus a bottom-up, really being community-led, community-informed, and then community-navigated and guided. So we really thought we have to think about 
how to use and implement Lex Leadership in a way that's going to make sense in order for these family resource centers to really be successful. So that's kind of how we kind of got into the Lex Leadership space. Um, I think we may have learned, gotten that term from one of our Prevent Child Abuse America uh, workshops, really like Lex Leadership. And I was like, that's it. Folks with lived experience can talk about what works, what doesn't work, and what could be successful. Where are those gaps? So one of our project outcomes for the Family Resource Center are those these beautiful bubbles um, that we have here. One of the pieces that I do want to um, highlight, of course, is that we wanted a cross-system approach. What we realize is sometimes in human services, we can be so siloed and we can focus on one model, one project, one thing without always tying the lap, the tying up the gaps between services. Families are falling in between the gaps as they go from one thing to another. Sometimes we don't have more handoffs. Folks get dropped off. So we knew we wanted to have a cross-system approach. We also knew that we needed a cross-system network of collaborative partnerships, meaning that if I am in my state, seat as a prevention organization. I need to look at other family um, serving organizations. I need to talk to churches. I need to talk to lived expertise. We need to talk to community leaders. We also need to talk to the business community because what we do know is that prevention is everyone's business and prevention is good business. So how do we talk? have those conversations with those folks? We want to also be able to evaluate the family support systems that exist and then see what we can refine and make things better. And then also looking at well-being measures that cut across all human service programs. So when we thought about our FRCs, that's kind of the, the, the five approaches that we wanted to really make sure we were able to kind of lean in on and then start to measure. And so this is just a map of Virginia. Um, I love to show how we're kind of in this quarter, this is kind of our 95 South quarter. So if you're here, but going on 95, it kind of runs right through here. Um, and then we also have our Western quarter here. So these are our seven FRCs that are existing and, and working today. I will say the one, this one here, is actually a mobile FRC. They actually have resources in a mobile unit and they drive around the community to um, link residents of that area, um, that specific census tract area to resources that they need. So that, F, that is a mobile FRC. So what we've learned is that even FRCs are very specific to the communities that they serve. And so we were really excited to have that idea kind of come out. And I was like, wow, we could put, <laughs> put FRCs on the road. But that's how that particular one is working here in, the, in our Northern Virginia area, which is very congested, but they're also very a lot of pocket of needs that we found. And then we have gone, when we are here in Southwest Virginia, which is a resource desert. So we really are finding that these FRCs are meeting people where they live, work and play, and developing really well-being, successful family self-sustainability measures. Say that three times fast. And so this is just a list. I'll skip that because you saw the map. Um, we also do a lot of Lex training and support. And so these are some of the things that we offer our Lex leaders. Every There's a Lex leader in every one of our seven FRCs. And those Lex leaders are then informed and empowered to recruit other, recruit other Lex leaders to kind of help with the work. And so these are some of the things that we um, provide as far as training and technical support for our Lex leadership. And what we do know, at the end of the day, when we think about the work and what we've been talking about today around neglect and, and the strategies to kind of mitigate that, is it really is all about community connections. Now, I have Lex leaders here um, on the screen, but really it's really about the community connection and how we all play a part in connecting communities, even within our work as colleagues, but then as we connect with families, families connect to other families, and then all of a sudden we're connecting to communities. And then that's how we kind of create this bubble of good is what I call it, that prevention ecosystem, if you will, that allows all the various parts and pieces in this prevention strategy to work together and really move families through the various stages to success, well-being, self-sustainability. And so I think what we'll do since we are close to time, these slides will be available. I, 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 I believe they will be, but this is a little bit more about the family support, National Family Support Network, which we are a part of that kind of gives us a framework for the FRC, FRC approach. The, once again, the whole idea of strengthening families, which we've talked about before. 
And um, so, yeah, so that's the end of my portion. I appreciate everyone's time and attention. I appreciate the emojis. I saw that happening um, as I was speaking, but this is kind of where you can find us on all socials. Um, and I will pause here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Thanks so Thank much. You. Absolutely. Um, uh, if you want to, uh, yeah, perfect. I was going to say unshare your screens. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you before we jump into questions. We have a couple of them here for our panelists. Um, I just want to shout out Mia, Claire, and Jenny uh, for all of the amazing work that you're doing in the States uh, around this uh, very important uh, work. Uh, and topic. And thank you to Kelly as well for all her leadership at the national level uh, around policy and, and neglect in particular. So um, we have a couple of questions. And um, I think, Mia, if you don't mind, uh, just because you uh, uh, just wrapped up, there was a question around um, the uh, FRCs. Uh, and to what extent has Virginia and jurisdictions in general explore the concept of mobile FRCs for rural families. So you kind of alluded to that. Um, and have uh, scientists tested the extent to which location of FRCs contributes to service usage? So anything, Mia, that you would want to share about the mobile FRCs? Yeah, I think the mobile F F R FRC concept was kind of like, how did we not think about this earlier? It was just kind of like, wow, that's so inventive. Um, it just kind of came out of, of the application process. And so we we had an RFP process and we just put it out to the entire state and, and a Rotary Club and some community partners says, hey, we want to make this a mobile unit. And what's interesting about this mobile unit is that it serves other mobile units. So there's a whole collect neighborhood of mobile homes that are just like off the beaten path outside of the city and they were completely disconnected from resources. And so this mobile FRC was able to, is able to drive to all the mobile holding units to drop off resources. So it just made sense that that would be something that they would that would work well for that community. But I am excited that if we're able to expand our FRC network, that we would have the ability to look and explore other mobile you know, solutions um, if the community says that's what they want. Awesome. Thank you, Mia. Um, I am going to go next to Jenny. Um, I'm going to get a question for each of you uh, before we have to uh, sign off here. Um, Jenny, there was a question that came in when you were presenting um, that asked, how has your organization looked at addressing the needs of families who fall just short of receiving the benefits of social programs? Um, I think in terms of uh, there's a, we've really worked to develop a robust system of family resource centers throughout California um, that have access both to public benefits and often refer families and help them navigate public benefits, but also provide many other services um, and have blended and braided funding from various sources in order to be able to do that. So those services are things like counseling for mental health support, um, providing basic needs, uh, such as food and emergency services, uh, parenting classes, some have child care, some have uh, just respite care, so things like that. So I think I think that's what the question is, but that we also then provide um, case management that connects people to both public and other resources available in county. Great. And uh, I think we have time for one more. Uh, Jess, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, this, I'm actually going to start with you, Claire. Um, uh, and it says, what work is being done to advance the role of fathers as equal to that of mothers? Um, change this historical assumption that children are best supported by the mother. Um, so let's start with you, Claire. And if uh, we have time, maybe Mia or, or Jenny can jump in as well. Awesome. So I totally agree with the the intent of this question, which is that there is this unequal focus on mothers and fathers historically. And so I think it starts with awareness. We have a, a series of trainings that we did last year at Prevent Child Abuse Arizona that helps people who work with families better engage with fathers to understand it, the, the, the cultural differences between mothers and fathers, because there are kind of cultural or, or different practices, different ways to better approach uh, different genders. And, uh, and so it, it does start with that awareness. I just wanna to touch on very briefly since we have 
no time left on the Lex Leader compensation. Uh, yes, Lex Leaders, it is a, a best practice to compensate Lex Leaders for their very valuable perspective, just to answer a couple of those questions. And uh, we get funding through a variety of sources. Uh, Casey Family Programs, Prevent Child Abuse America through a grant from Kellogg was able to support uh, some stipends for lived expert participation. Excellent. Great. Uh, I just want to say thank you again. And then uh, thank you again to all of you for joining us. Uh, this was great. Thank you uh, to the panelists. And I'm going to turn it back to Jess uh, to close us up. I mean, on behalf of Caltrin and all of the participants today, we just want to extend just a, a thank you for all of the expertise and the information that you brought today. You'll start to see those thank yous rolling in. I know it. Tons of I love your little celebration hats. They're fun. So for those of you asking, are we going to get a copy of the slides? What about this recording? Yes, yes, and yes. All of that information will come to your inbox. What we're going to drop into the chat now, you might see it kind of pop in between all these wonderful thank yous, is a survey. That brief survey gives you access to your certificate of attendance today. So as we drop that, make sure you catch that link. And again, to the panelists, we want to thank you so much for being here and to all the attendees as well. We hope to see you all again very soon. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody.